Um, this is the feedback on the multi-choice that I set over half term. It starts with that question on um, potatoes and um, bread. Um, so, the uh, first one then, um, yeah, um, first one then is, is the potatoes and bread question. Um, um, what we can see, yeah, um, is re remembering what PPF show, yeah, which is um, they show the, the potential output of each. There's an increase in the potential output of potatoes. So something's happened in the market for potatoes that allows us to make more. Um, but at the same time, we can make less bread. So it's not just something like an increase in the population, because otherwise that would lead to an increase in both. So what it's got to be is something affecting the efficiency of potato production. Perhaps we've got um, genetically modified potatoes, something like that. Yeah? At the same time, something's happened in the bread industry that means that fundamentally we can't produce as much as we used to be able to. So perhaps there's new regulations, something along those lines. People tended to go for people tended to go for some people said it's profit, um, some people said changing in, an increase in employment. But but those things, you know, both of those. I mean, if, you know, if we switch over to the whiteboard, yeah, I mean, both of those things. Um, yeah, if that's potatoes, yeah, and that's um, uh, bread, um, then changing employment just means that we're switching resources from one to the other. Likewise, a change in profitability towards potatoes would mean that we would switch resources. So what's happened here is that fundamentally, yeah, if I'd drawn it like that, then everybody would go, oh, yeah, it's an increase in the, you know, it's an increase in the profitability, so it's an increase in the efficiency of potatoes or productivity or something. Yeah, yeah so the right answer um, is D, an increase in productivity um, of potatoes and a decrease in productivity of bread. Um, the second one everybody got right, yeah, which is mixed economy. Yeah. Um, then, uh, so, so the right answer is um, the right answer is C. Um, the next one, okay, yeah, that, this is quite an interesting one. Well, um, third one was um, which of the following will increase productivity um, of uh, sorry no isn't sorry mobility of labour in the UK. Um, well, that's quite interesting. So mobility of labour, yeah, I mean, um, can refer to a number of things. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's linked to labour market flexibility. So if we were to you know, if we were to take you know, if we take this idea of flexibility, then flexibility can be wage flexibility. Yeah. So then that's linked to things like minimum wage and so on. Yeah. And then you know, mobility of labour. And mobility of labour can be either you know, geographical between areas or occupational. Yeah, um, between um, yeah, be between different jobs, and those are linked to some of your supply side types of unemployment. Yeah, real wage unemployment caused by things like minimum wage, um, structural unemployment caused by geographical and occupational um, immobilities. But in this case, they're, they're obviously when you look at the answers, you know, they're obviously yeah, they're obviously focusing on yeah the, these mobilities, particularly the geographical one. Yeah. So one of the one of the reasons that we got problems in the labour market in the UK um, is house price differentials. Yeah, you know, it's it's very difficult to you know, for for workers to relocate from areas of high unemployment to, to areas of low unemployment. So the right answer is C, narrowing house price differentials. Some people went for E because they weren't sure what tolls on motorways meant, which just means charging for motorways, which again would make it harder to move from one area to another, and therefore wouldn't help to improve mobility. Um, economies of scale, everyone got that one basically. Um, yeah, which is you know obviously they um, yeah they cause a reduction in long run average costs. Um, it's just worth bearing in mind that yeah um, when we when we taught economies of scale um, yeah actually I taught economies and diseconomies separately. It's just worth bearing in mind yeah that we have economies of scale up to that point, which is the minimum efficient scale, internal economies of scale. Um, and we have internal diseconomies of scale um, beyond that point. Yeah. Um, so, so it's, it's, you know, it's just one curve where initially costs go down as we get bigger, and um, eventually we get diseconomies of scale as we get further. Yeah, you know, we get even bigger, um, and we get problems with communication, coordination, and control. And public good, everyone gets this one right. Basically, consumption. Yeah, you know, this is non-excludable. Consumption of one um, doesn't deny consumption of another. Um, six, um, market failure, again, um, essentially everybody gets that right as well, um, a situation in which a market doesn't allocate resources efficiently. Um, seven, seven, is, you know, seven is the first one where, you know, where, I, think, where, where I think people, people struggled. Um, you know, so quite a lot of people got this one wrong. And what it's saying is, you know, essentially we give it away for free, yeah, then 
um, what happens what happens to consumer surplus so initially we're supply we're demand we're price and there's consumer surplus at price p1 the difference between what people are prepared to pay which is marginal utility and what they do pay which is the equilibrium price suppose we give it away for zero give it away for free price is zero well of course people will consume it up until the point at which marginal utility is zero you might as well have it um, um, if you're not paying for it Therefore, consumer surplus will now be the whole of that. I mean, it's a stupid idea because, yeah, it's massively inefficient. The marginal cost is far above the marginal utility. But, yeah, in, in strict answer to the question, consumer surplus therefore increases by this bottom trapezium here. Um, some pollution may be economic desirable. Um, but, so question eight. Mo most people got this. Um, some people were distracted by A, which is the cost of reducing pollution are very high. I mean, that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, if the costs of reducing pollution are very high, that doesn't matter if the damage from pollution is very, very high. So the right answer is actually B, yeah, which is that the costs of additional pollution, yeah, which is yeah, the, the pollution that we get, are, are actually outweighed by the cost of reducing it. Yeah? So it is pointless to reduce it. Let's face it, we're always going to have some pollution. Yeah, that, that's life. Yeah? Um, but we accept some of it because we know that getting rid of it will be more damaging. Um, over the page to question nine. Um, okay, so this is um, this is this is the first one that everybody gets. Yeah, well, not everybody, but but the vast majority of people um, get wrong. Um, and it's kind of the reverse of a tax question. Yeah, so so it's a subsidy question, and it's asking you to calculate the air, the total area of the subsidy. So what we know first of all is that a subsidy will shift supply from S one, which is marginal cost to SS, which is marginal cost minus the subsidy. But, um, so, so what we can say is that the subsidy per unit is S, or £10 or something along those lines. Um, and we know we start here in equilibrium at, say, 100 units, yeah, and we know that the price is whatever it is, and yeah, um, 20 quid. Um, so to find the cost of the subsidy, all it is, is it's whatever the new cost is, because that's the number of units on which the subsidy has to be paid, multiplied by the subsidy per unit, which is that or that or that or that. So therefore we get this weird looking area here, yeah, which is the subsidy per unit times the number of units. Yeah, so it's that area there. And on the diagram that's MPWF, yeah, which is which is E. So similar to the tax diagram, which most of you can do, yeah, but the other way around. Ten, assume market provide so if a market provides a merit good, yeah, they won't provide enough of it. Yeah, um, so therefore, the current quantity is going to be too low. That's the key. Um, we then head to question 11, 12, 11. So this one, this so so eleven is the eleven is the tax question. Yeah, um, and what what you can see, yeah, um, what you can see, yeah, um, you can see it here, yeah, um, yeah, I. Yeah, so it's not quite marked in. I'm not. I'm, I'm not getting properly myself. Yeah. So, so, so the tax then is the same as the one we just did a minute ago on the subsidy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the total tax is the large blue area there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the tax per unit times the number of units. So the total tax is forty times seven, which is two hundred eighty. From the consumer's perspective, prices rise from twelve to fifteen. So they're paying three pounds out of the seven, which is one hundred and twenty quid. Therefore, the producer, although they've pushed price up to 15, they've got to pay a tax of 7 to the government. They only stay, um, they, only, they only get to keep 8. So from the firm's point of view, they've, you know, they, they've had to absorb £4 of tax um, on 40 units, so that costs them 160 quid. The next one, um, question 12, is um, a guaranteed minimum price question. Um, and they've worded it quite weirdly, but the, the, but, but the yeah, but it's really fairly simple, which is suppose that's the guaranteed minimum price of 100 quid. The problem for the government then is that only 50 units are bought from the market, yeah, whereas 90 are produced by firms. Therefore, um, you know, they support, you know, they, 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 they engage in intervention buying. They've got to buy AV units. They've got to buy 40 units. Um, they pay 100 quid. So for each one of these units, you've got to pay 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, or alternatively 40 times 100, which is 4,000 quid, which is that area there. So therefore, the and when we remove that, therefore the government saves itself all of that money. So therefore, 
um, the right answer is NUQR, yeah, which is E. Um, 13, is another, 13 is another relatively interesting question. Um, because it tests, it, it tests, no, that's all down now. Thank you. Um, it tests three different things. It tests two different things. Yeah? Firstly, what you can see from this question yeah, is yeah, that the firm's total revenue goes like that. That immediately rules out perfect competition. Um, and the reason for that yeah, um, is that in perfect competition, we know that MR and AR are horizontal, and therefore total revenue rises like that. Yeah. This, therefore, is a firm with a downward sloping demand line. Therefore, that means that it's imperfect or non-perfect competition. The second thing um, that the diagram shows you is it shows you the profit line, yeah, um, which goes like that. And it says that the profit maximizing output, A or something, Q, um, in, the, in the question, sorry, Q, um, yeah, that's the best that they can do. So they're making only normal, they're making zero economic profit, so they're making normal profit. And we know that normal profit is the minimum profit needed to keep factor production in their current use. Or it's just where total revenue equals total cost. Or, in other words, it's where, you know, it's where average revenue equals average cost, yeah, which is E. Uh, that's 13, 14. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so, again, so this this one, 14. Yeah, 14 is a, is a, is a question that I, I would have said is the one that almost everybody gets wrong. Yeah, um, yeah, which is you know, which is quite weird. Yeah, so what you've got is you've got yeah, what what to me at least looks obviously like monopolistic competition because you've got yeah, demand and AR like that. You've got yeah, average cost like that. I mean, they haven't filled in the rest of it, yeah, but um, but it's obviously not perfect competition. I mean, I know it's making normal profit. It's obviously not perfect competition because the demand line is downward sloping for the firm. Yeah, so it can't be perfect competition. Um, and they're making normal profits. Well, why are they making normal profits? Presumably because there's no barriers to entry. So that therefore the answer is C. Yeah, a firm in imperfect competition, yeah, so not perfect, with no barriers to entry, which means that it only makes only makes normal profit in the long run. So yeah, so there are all sorts of weird answers to that one. Yeah? Um, people tend to go for A, perfect competition, or B, or sorry, D, a firm producing the technically optimum point. Well, technically optimal is productive efficiency, which is the minimum point of average cost curve. And next one, everybody got right, which was productive efficiency, like we just said. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, yeah. So what output is productively efficient? That one there, which is Q3 on the question. Um, after that, where do we go now? Um, 16. Um, which of the following is necessary to practice price discrimination? Um, some people were distracted by B. Consumers must be unaware. That, that's not strictly true. I know that you pay less than me for cinema tickets, yeah. Um, but there's not much. There's not much that I can do about it, yeah. Um, so, um, so it can help in some markets, yeah. So, like in pink versus blue price discrimination, it can be useful. But it's not essential. The key is that different groups have different price elasticity to demand. So the reason the cinema can charge me more than you is that fundamentally I want more money than you, or at least they assume I have. Um, therefore, my price elasticity demand is lower, um, and therefore they can charge me a higher price. Uh, the 17 was abnormal profit. <laughs> yeah, th thank, thank Christ, nobody got this one wrong. Um, so everybody managed to identify, I think. Yeah, so, so it's just a standard monopoly diagram. Yeah, um, DAR, um, MR like that. That's not very good. As you know, that should be halfway. Um, there's AC. Yeah, there's MC. So we produce output Q1, price is P1, cost is C1, and that's your abnormal profit. So, and um, no, they haven't got, you know, that's very stupid of them. They haven't got the, sen they haven't got, oh yes, they have got the sensible distractor. No, it's fine. Um, right, so so therefore it's EPAF, which is E. Um, on to the home straight now. Um, so question 23 caused far more difficulties than um, than I thought it was going to. Um, because everybody's getting confused by the idea of outflows. Yeah? And everybody's going, going, oh, if it's outflow, somebody has to buy it or something. If you go back to when I first taught you exchange rates, yeah, um, and often it can be a good idea to draw a quick diagram alongside the question, then what we said is that supply is equal to imports plus capital outflows, demand is exports plus capital inflows. Yeah, um, it's fairly clear now that if there's an excessive outflow of sterling, outflows increase, supply shifts to S2, the exchange rate goes down. Um, 24. Uh, devaluation would result in a fall in what? So it's, again, it's, it's remembering, well, what is it that devaluation does? 
Yeah, the only thing that devaluation, yeah, definitely does, yeah, devaluation, yeah, um, it leads to a decrease in the price of exports, even, yeah, stop that, <laughs> yeah, um, in, at least a decrease in the price of exports in dollar terms, and at least an increase in the price of imports in sterling terms. The terms of trade is price of exports over price of imports, yeah, that's gone up, therefore the terms of trade is worse. Um, 25 was also about the terms of trade, yeah, um, and people got distracted by A, yeah, and, and A says the value of exports rises by more than the value of imports. The problem with this, yeah, is that by, by value, yeah, value of exports is X, which is the price of exports in pounds times the quantity of exports. And the value of imports, M, is the price of imports in pounds times the quantity of imports. So, in other words, value doesn't mean price. Yeah, value means total expenditure. And therefore, you had to go for B, the import prices rise by less than their export prices. So the terms of trade is going to improve if the price of imports goes up, but the price of exports goes up by more. Yeah, then the, yeah, if, again, we talked about this before. If you're Russia and you're selling oil, the price of, ex price of oil has gone up by a lot. Okay, the price of cheese has gone up, but hey, not to worry. Um, into the home straight, uh, 29. Um, what you've got is you've got 29. You've got an increase in the money supply, yeah, and you've also got an increase in capital investment, capital stock. An increase in the capital stock is investment. So you've got an increase in investment, you've got an increase in the money supply, that's going to increase AD, that's going to increase AD, which is going to, it's like QE. Yeah, but in the long run, that's going to increase AS as well. Yeah, we're going to increase the potential of the economy. Yeah, therefore, the right answer for that one is C. Uh, nearly that. Um, so two to go. Um, 32, 32 was this one with um, deciles, yeah. And um, so with deciles, what not? We we generally put, um, yeah. What well, we always put the lowest group one on the left, yeah, is the yeah the, the first decile is the poorest, the you know, the um, the furthest to the right, the the last decile is the is the richest. We can see very clearly, yeah, that low income groups spend far more on food than rich groups, and also far more on fuel than rich groups. So if you tax it, it's obviously going to be regressive. Yeah, so I don't know, somebody came up with some of you came up with some strange ideas here, yeah, but the right answer is the easy one, which is A. Um, and then the Nehru, um, yeah, most of you got that right because we've been doing it recently. Yeah, um, Nehru is the rate of unemployment, yeah, which inflation doesn't accelerate. In other words, compatible with any stable rate of inflation. Okay, so keep at them. Um, yeah, if you if you're looking for practice, there's one up in the library at the moment um, that I haven't taken away yet. It's a multi and short answers. If you just want to do the multis, um, that's fine by me.